Now we have paper ID 248 on panel. So maybe we can start with paper ID 248 and then the remaining as per the sequence. Huh? Okay. So shall we start now? No, no. Vijay Lakshmi, let us join. It is still five minutes is there, no? Okay. Okay. Hello, 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 Sadhana Madam and uh, Neha Kumari. Good morning. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, good morning, Vijay Lakshmi. Yeah, yes, you are audible. Huh? Yes, yes. And you joined it in time. I was about to call you. Uh. Uh, yeah, yeah. No. I tried by 10.50 only. So, I mean, there was issue in the network. Yeah, I. Yeah. I think we'll, we, we, could, we, we could not do paper ID 248 yesterday. Yeah, so we yeah. start with uh, that and then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. Uh, start with the new yes yeah, yeah. Yeah. okay man. no issue. Aishwarya is not there. We have Sri Raksha who will be uh, joining us in all yes, the yeah, yeah. oh. yes. Then Sri Raksha, you can put that PowerPoint yesterday you had. Shiraksha, you're there? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm here, ma'am. So you'll take control. I have given you the host as a presenter. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Ma I request all the presenters to rejoin with their IDs, please. Name followed by IDs. Shall we start, Jay Lakshmi? Yes, madam, we can start. Yes. Neha? Yeah, good morning to all. 
I am Sadhana Atavar, Chair of WA Track BHTC. And we will start this track by paper ID 248, which was which could not be completed yesterday. A very warm welcome to all the participants. Uh, on behalf of IEEE Bangalore section, I extend a warm welcome to Nega Kumari, who is the host, to Dr. Vijay Lakshmi, who will be the session chair, and uh, to Sri Raksha, who, who will be coordinating with you. And a warm welcome to all the participants who have come here to uh, present the paper and also other participants who have joined us for this session. A warm welcome to one and all or to Dr. Vijay Lakshmi. Yes, yeah, good morning to everyone. Uh, I thank for the opportunity given uh, from Sadhana Madam uh, for uh, uh, having uh, me to all the participants and all the for this uh, special WA track on technology for uh, women empowerment. We can start the session. All the best for uh, the participants, uh, this paper presenters. Good morning, good morning panelists and good morning attendees. I'm Sri Raksha. I will be your student co volunteer today to help you. In case of any, uh, any difficulties, please feel to contact me in the chat box. Now I'll, uh, I'd like to give a small intro about our session chair, Dr. Vijayalakshmi, ma'am. Dr. Vijayalakshmi is currently working as a professor and head of the department medical electronics BMSCE Bangalore. She has obtained UG degree in electronics and communication from Sri Siddhaganga Institute of Technology, Tumkur. Ma'am PG degree in biomedical instrumentation from SJCE Mysore. Ma'am holds a PhD from VMU Salim. Her PhD thesis title Independent Component Analysis of EEG Signals. Ma'am has uh, published Ma'am has 18 publications to her credit in international and national journals and conference. She had an undertaken collaborative project with the national and international institutes or hospitals. Raman Research Institute, Nimas Nimans, Research Centers of Art and Living, Veda Vajina Mahavidya Peta, Research Center of, of SVYSEA, Jimini Bangalore. She has she has executed two funded projects. She has co-investigated for funded projects from DST and VGST. Her research interests are biomedical signal processing and biomedical image processing. Ma'am is very passionate about nature, farming, and traveling. I welcome our session chair, Vijayalakshmi ma'am. Ma'am, welcome ma'am. It's a honor to have you as a session chair today. Thank you very much for your introduction. We can uh, start the session from the first presenter. Yes. We have a first presenter, paper ID 248, Ankita Kulkarni, ma'am. Ma'am, I'll be giving you the presenter host. Yes. Present. yes. Ankita Kulkarni, paper number 248. Ma'am, you are the presenter. You can present your presentation now. Neha, are you recording? <laughs> No, it's it's been been recording, ma'am. Oh. No, we are not able to hear. You you'll have to unmute Ankita. Neha, we are not able to hear the presenter's audio. Ankita, can you connect with with your system? The audio you have not connected, you connected with the system. There's an option at the bottom. Connect audio with your computer system. Thank <laughs> you. 
Yes. Yes. Yeah. Superb. Superb. That sounds perfect. Thank you. Thank you for acknowledging me. So I'll just quickly uh, share my content, and I request you folks to <laughs> let me know whether it's right. Visible at the other end. Not yet, Ankita. Yes, okay. it is visible. Please go on full screen. Slide show. Sure, sure. Yeah. Now the screen is completely visible, right? For you, for the entire team there. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, a very good morning, one and all. And as our uh, ma'am Sadhana and Vijay Lakshmi and Sri Raksha welcomed us with a very warm welcome. Even I would like to take this moment and give you a warm welcome. Myself, Ankita Kulkarni, I work as a senior software developer with Scientific Game Company. And, and I'm here in front of you, though virtually, to have some discussions and the insights on human computer interaction system using eye tracking. Uh, this is a piece of research which has done a real implementation along uh, with my fellow mates. And it's a collaborative effort, you know, to get this uh, real time feature get implemented. So, this piece of beautiful research was performed under the direction and guidance of Professor Jayashri A. Patel. So, I take this moment and I really feel blessed and privileged to take this time that's the 10 minutes duration and share my perspectives on this beautiful concept. So with this note, let's dive into its details. Yeah, so let's set an agenda. What, what we are gonna discuss in next couple of minutes. So let's have this pointer. We will walk through an introduction to understand what human computer interaction is and how the eye tracking technology has been employed in order to understand this particular concept. Well, with this, we'll have some historical survey and we will discuss on the features. We will have some walkthrough on the trackers and types. And I will explain a very high level note, its implementation details, its areas of applications and the outcomes along with the concluding notes. So having this agenda in hand, can we just quick dive into the introduction? Well, let's start. So this slide is, speaks about the introduction. So what I want to emphasize over here is human computer interaction on one hand and eye tracking in other hand. How we can bring this together to achieve something in the form of a software industry where we can solve many of the real time use cases, right? So with this thought in mind, I would like to make you all walk through this particular concept. Well, so let's see what a human computer interaction is all about. It's just an interaction or the means of communication that exists between a normal human beings like us and a highly educated computer system, right? So in this process of attaining the communication between the two real time entities, Okay, what are the things which we can resolve by getting together in the real modern era of technology? So emphasis is on how we can improvise the communication or sharing of thoughts between a human being and a computer. So what comes into picture is the eye tracking technology, which is a very beautiful technology, you know, uh, where the human beings eye tracking or the eye movement an input source to drive a piece of software and handle so many usability issues. Really interesting, is it? And how it is achieved and to drive the input system, like how we drive. Now I'm using my mouse to navigate one slide to another slide. But if my if my eye movements are used, my hand involvement is not required to make this transition, right? Such a beautiful day-to-day real-time use cases can be implemented for the ease of use in this modern world. 
with this introductory note, I would like to get you all into our next understandings or just I would like to share my thoughts rather. So let's quickly understand how is it achieved, right? When we have two important concepts, one is the eye tracking. This is a medium to enhance the communication. Now for me, microphone is enhancing communication with you all. I'm able to connect with you all here, right? Similarly, eye tracking can be a medium which is used to connect with everyone. So let's understand how is it done? Well, it's all done through an algorithm. Means set of instructions which we will instruct the computer in the form of a program so that it gives us an enormous beautiful results. You know? So what, how is this achieved actually? Whenever a person sits, his eye movements are captured. Those are the live captures, you know. So those are all programmed on the visualization techniques. That is the motion detection technique and the template matching concepts, which is a beautiful part of image processing. All these beautiful pieces of design can be combined together. It's an amalgamation of all this. So like this, with this short introductory note, where I, where I stated, it's all about the calculations, it's all about the algorithm, it's all about the programs, right? So let's understand where this human computer interaction with eye tracking concept and having a algorithms, wherein all it's used, right? It's used in various fields, team. It's, it's, it's really used in various teams starting from a uh, retail, automobile, cognition, machine learning, IOTs, and a lot of business use cases where it is enhancing the software industry and solving many of the usability issues. So with this, I would like to highlight about features. So the algorithms, we have human computer interaction in one hand, eye tracking in another hand, and now we know this is achieved through algorithms, the important algorithms. So what makes it more important as a significant feature? How I can say, as I'm an end user, my eyeball movement is significant feature. For that to understand, it depends upon the three important factors. That is the block, a frequency, and a gradient. It's not just a concept. All togetherly form a complete technique itself. Let's say when a human being notices an object, the area is captured, right? And whatever he visualizes, the frames are detected, okay? And those blocks are compared in that particular region of focus. And considering the axis, the external medium, the light source, all the internal computations are done as a gradient visuals. So these are all fed to the computer in the form of a source code or in the form of a program. That's why a human being eye will be run successfully as an input to the piece of software and it solves very end results or very usability issues. So with this understanding of its feature, let's understand its types. What are its main categorization? So let's quickly understand, we have different eye trackers in the market right now, okay? These can be of eye attachment, they can be a sensors, or they can be some uh, type of contact lens, special type of contact lens, which you can wear as a glass, or which you can use as a contact lenses as well. It can be a non-contact tracker or an optical tracker, and it can be an electrical potentials, which can be used to achieve the various outcomes. With this understanding of the history, its important features and the types, let's understand what are the different types of eye tracking, the different categorizations, the broad classification, yeah? So since I mentioned eye movements, the eye blinks are the input to the source system, are the input to the computer system. So which is determined by the pupil area Right, the pupil organ of our eye drives the input for the piece of software. Correct. So, so let's having an understanding of this bright pupil and dark pupil forms the two important tracking types. It depends upon the location of the pupil, 
where the person is standing and how is the area of light and where the person is standing and where is the area of light. That's the bright pupil and dark pupil. With this quick walkthrough of its tribes, let's and the implementation detail. So I'll quickly make you understand how this piece of research helps us in solving one of the usability issue. Okay, that is, let's say you all are sitting in front of a computer and there is a web camera that captures your eye move and you all are blinking your eyes, like you're turning your eyes, blinking your eyes, and that drives some device. Let's say an electrical fan is connected or tube light is connected, or some other X device is connected. With your eye movement, if that particular hardware switches on, that's really that's really fantabulous, right? So that's what the diagram speaks about. So let's so let me walk you through it details where I will emphasize on how the code flow is, the real workflow on the implementation is. Just taking a moment, I would like to explain the entire flow. So let's assume we all are sitting in front of a com computer and it has a web cam attached to it. So now, once the face area has been identified, so a motion of eye are determined based upon the input, that is the motion detection. And once the input template has been identified, the system demands that it's an eye object, guys, it has to be identified. So let's say now that once the eye has been identified, its motion, it may be a blink or it may be a, uh, it may be a rotation itself, okay? So that determination is done by input frames. That is using the pattern matching technology of an image processing. So wherein the comparisons are made, the internal calculations are performed and we detect the direction of an eye movement, okay? So once, the particular eye movement has been identified. We determine the threshold value for the piece of code that runs on a computer. So let's say the threshold value is X. With this, it determines the person has I and it drives the hardware. And if the threshold is Y, then the person has detected a blink, not just a rotation. Then it's a, a, a movement, right? In this way, the categorization has been done from the eye movement. So this is all about the implementation or high level architecture, which has been implemented in real time. I would like to take a couple of minutes to emphasize on the areas of applications. In optical flow theory, right? In the process of ontology and in the process of uh, uh, various optical flows, eye movements can be used. Let's say we all as end users, right? We enter a grocery shop and we see certain products placed on the rack. What is the point of interest? What the person is interested in is captured by our eye movement, right? So in this real-time scenarios, these processes can be automated with a piece of software and the concept. And in smart home technology, this, can, this has a wide area of scope, okay? We can make certain things to run by its own. Let's say we enter a home and we want to switch on our gizzard. This can be automated using our eye movements. This is just a thought, which we can mold it in the form of a software and bring it to the real world. And human-computer interaction, which I already emphasized here, like eye movements are used to drive any hardware device, like a tube light, or it's normal bulb, or it's a fan, or anything. If we are sitting here on a seat, and if I'm blinking our eyes and making, the, making some hardware device to run, it's really, really a very, good implementation, right? So that's how this technology helps to achieve the greatest and the latest things which helps the normal end users like us. So with this, I will emphasize on the results. When a person gives his eye movements to the computer, which is having a web camera, okay, all the eye movements are being captured and it runs a piece of code on the computer. In this way, eyes are acting as a communication medium, like we are using the language. Eye movement is used as a language to communicate to the computer. It gives an output like this, and this piece of output will drive the system. So with this results, I'd like to wrap up my presentation emphasizing on two keynotes.
how this implementation, this process, this computations are done. So this blink detection technique is totally based upon the motion detection, okay, where detection of a motion of eye is computed using the vector maps. Means all are mathematical calculations which are performed using a MATLAB software and then feed it into the piece of code that run as a software, okay? And then eye movements, it may be a up, upward movement, downwards movement, right movement and a left movement. All this together are captured by a piece of code that runs on a computer system and that is actually done by a template matching technique, okay? With this understanding of my insights, which I felt to share with you, I would like to conclude, and there are various references I've done starting from Wikipedia to all the big, big author references to understand the base and then implement a piece of code and to achieve a real time model. With this, I would like to end my presentation with a full stop, giving a full stop, but I want to give you all a thought running in your mind so that everyone can have this topic in your mind Let's all together we make something new, challenging for the ease of use. As it says, together we can make wonders, right? Yeah. So let's all unite together and make some wonders in this challenging times. So I would like to mention my gratitude to each one of you for giving me this moment again to reiterate my papers. Thank you one and all for listening to me patiently. So thank you. Anyways, open to the questions, guys. Yeah. Yeah, it was a nice presentation, Ankit. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, sort of uh, uh, objectives are very clear and uh, you have explained very well. Uh, just a few questions for you. Uh, have you used yeah, any standard templates? Yeah, have you used any standard templates, Ankita? For example, um, you told, uh, in order to... Yeah. Yes, yes, please go ahead, ma'am. Yeah. yeah, for uh, uh, for uh, movements, uh, do you have, do you mm -hmm. have with any standard templates or you created yeah. the templates? The standard templates so, were all, yeah, I, yeah, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your question. So the standard templates were created actually in the form of a code with this particular calculation using MATLAB functions and vector calculations. And then whatever comes in as an end user will be mapped with those calculations and then we can predetermine where exactly we should go. So this is how the code flow works now. Yeah. Uh, but uh, one thing, uh, it is hmm. showed the result, only the pictures of hmm. the eye which is captured. Yes. They have not shown yes. any yes. Control signal generated, any control signal generated uh, from the captured signal. Why? Uh, yeah, uh, actually, without uh, capture signals, when those signals are generated through a piece of code, we had all hardware connected over here, ma'am. So we couldn't get that picture and the showcase over here. At least, yeah, at least we could have shown the control signal what you generated. Uh, captured of a yeah. eye and a face in a drone, drone. Yeah. That is uh, what a little bit incomplete in the way. Yeah, I understand. I got, got you, got your point. Yeah. Yeah. As you told, uh, some control signal can be generated. You could have shown one yes. application or how it looks yeah. and how much is yes. the threshold value you have taken. That is also not yeah. shown in this one because yeah. uh, for uh, different age level, the threshold may definitely it is going to vary because for children, yeah, yeah exactly for, children, for youngsters for any elderly people definitely the thresholds has to, to be it's going to vary uh, very that exactly not, yeah that what you are not touched and uh, yeah, yeah in future if you are continuing this work uh, just yeah. uh, take this into consideration how you fix the threshold for a uh, uh, age particular age children, group yeah so age group yeah different age group and you mm. have to work for a larger number of samples for how many samples yeah. you have worked right now uh, samples in the sense uh you want to me the count uh, how many subjects yeah how many subjects you have worked on kita uh, how many samples uh, you have Samples like three to four samples we have worked, ma'am, for here for this particular uh, implementation. 
Any any hardware processor you have used? Uh, no, nothing as such. It's a normal, uh, no processor and all, and nothing external has been used over here. Yeah. Okay, because uh, you told uh, there are so many hardwares were used which you could not show. That's why this question came. Okay, okay, no problem. The hardware in the sense, the hardware in the sense, a small mini uh, fan and a tube light, how it glows was used as a hardware unit here. Yeah. Okay, okay. okay. Thank you so much for your valuable insights, ma'am. And I definitely take into consideration as a suggestion. And let's make it something beautiful in next upcoming things. And I definitely take it personally for myself. Thank you, one and all. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank you. I request participants to join with their IDs and also to, to look at the time. And we have a constraint that is 20 minutes. We consider the time constraint while joining, while presenting. So now uh, we have an ex-presenter, uh, paper ID 273. Ma'am, uh, I have made you as a presenter. You can go ahead, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you're audible. You can uh, share the slides. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir, you're audible. Sir. Is my screen visible? Uh, not, not yet, sir. Not yet, sir. Okay, hold on. How about now? Uh, I think, uh, yes, sir. We can see your screen, sir. It's visible, sir. You can continue. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Kushal Nai. And on behalf of my group, I would like to present a research paper on assessing the impact of retrofitting programs on land cover Belgavi town area using Sentinel 2 data. Let's look into the problem statement that we have chosen to tackle. Unavailability of spatial data for farmers and environment, uh, environmentalists to infer and act upon. No system to rely on for unbiased classification of terrain in cities like Belgavi. Third party analysis for retrofitting programs on Belgavi city. Keeping these problems in mind, we have listed these three objectives. Firstly, remotely surveying and assess assessing terrestrial vegetation of area encompassing Belgavi city, comparing and contrasting vegetation indices of said region over a duration of four years, observing and influencing retrofitting programs like emission and green saviors on Belgavi city. The reason we have chosen remote sensing as the basis of our technology was to collect information on large spatial areas, to characterize natural features or physical objects on the ground, to observe surface areas and objects on a systematic basis and monitor their changes over time, and to have the ability to integrate this data with other information to aid decision making. Taking the information from satellites, which is remote sensing, the science of collecting, the science of collecting data regarding an object or phenomenon without any physical contact with the object to geographic information system, which is a tool for mapping and analyzing features and events on Earth, is performed using, is performed using these four tools. GADM, which stands for Database of Global Administrative Areas, which provides us higher resolution maps of any country. This is an open access platform from which we have taken the satellite data, which is in the form of Sentinel-2 data. QGIS and ArcGIS are geographic information systems. Let us move into the period survey of it, of our research project. The satellite Sentinel-2 having multi-spectral instrument was launched in 2015. And since 2017, we have ob obtained clear high resolution images of Belgavi city. Hence, we have chosen 
the best months for our survey. Thus, from 2017 to 2020, we have totally 19 months of survey. And let us look into the processes that have been involved. Now, when we take the satellite images from Copernicus Hub, it is in the form of satellite images and it has 13 bands. Using these 13 bands, we calculate vegetation indices, NDVI and NDWI. NDWI and NDVI stand for Normalized Difference Vegetation Index and Normalized Difference Water Index. These indices quantify the amount of vegetation present and thus we can use this as the basis of our survey. When we find out the NDVI and NDWI images, we go on with the classification of these images into five classes. Those five classes are evergreens, water bodies, barren land, farm land, and build up area. This classification is only possible using our DIS tools and its processes, which are raster calculation, clipping, classification, and the tools involved are raster analysis tools, tools, and data management tools. Once we have classified Belgavi city into its five classes, we need to make sure that our remote sensing data and classification is up to the mark and shows the reality of what is happening. For that, we perform certain validation and classification. We calculate overall accuracy and kappa coefficient of all these NDVI images and classified images. When overall accuracy and kappa coefficient are performed with the analysis and surveying. Let us look into one of the snippet of our survey, January 2017 NDVI image. This is the Belgravi map NDVI image. As we can see, it's a grayscale image and we cannot observe details here. Hence, we do color ac accuracy and this image. On doing so, we see that the five classes occupy in the pie chart as follows. There is built up area, evergreens, farm, barren land, and water bodies. When we calculate overall accuracy and kappa coefficient for each image, we see that for Belgavi city, January 2017, the overall accuracy of classification comes to 87.5% and kappa coefficient comes to 84.4%. Kappa coefficient value says that the higher the value and the closer the value to overall accuracy, it means that our remote sensing and remote surveying is as the ground truth says or what is actually happening in reality. Also, the NDVI average shows the scale from plus one to minus one, where plus one is the maximum greenness and minus one is water bodies. Let us look into this similar survey over the period of the year 2017 and let's see how based on climatic and farm farming changes, the Belgian city map shifts. As we can see, over the, over the months, changes occur based on climatic and farming changes. And as the monsoon pass, again, in November and December, we see more greenery in and around Belgam city. These are the NDVI images. Let's look into the classified images. As we can see, the changes keep occurring based on the classification that has been performed using ArcGIS. And we have calculated overall accuracy and kappa coefficient for all, all these images over the span of 2017 to 2020. Those are 19 months. And when the standard is up to the mark and our overall accuracy is above 80%, we have carried out practical application. Our practical application has been done for Green Saviors. Green Saviors is an NGO or the retrofitting program which we have considered. NGO Green Saviors is a group of environmental enthusiasts who grow and maintain evergreens in and around Belgam city. So let us look into four of their prime locations where we have conducted our survey. Those, prime, uh, the, those four prime locations are 
Pragati Engineering location, Hanji Farms, Camp Area and Airport Area, which come in Belgaum City. We can see that in the green cover analysis, only in the span of one year, Hanji Farms has shown positive growth. But more importantly, when we see the barren cover analysis, we see that the amount of barren land present in all four locations has decreased, which is a good sign in just one year. Now, seeing the period of survey for all 19 months for these four locations, we see that from Jan 2017 to April 2020, we have conducted the survey and our ArcGIS processes on all four locations for Hanji Farms, Pragati Engineering, Camp Area and Airport Area for the NGO. And we see that because of environmental enthusiasts and our survey, we can make sure we can predict and maintain how the growth is happening. And since Jan 2017 to April 2020, there is positive growth in all four locations with an average of 4.6%. And most amount of progress is in the airport area with 5.6%. Hence, we come to the end and the objectives of our project. Given the scarce resources and time constraint, remote sensing and geospatial data and tools prove to be valuable in complementing other methods. Use of our tools and processes are a low cost method of generating baseline information that could provide directions both for future programming and impact assessment. These tools have the potential for a use in biophysical and socioeconomic baselines forecasting which can be which can help predict the generation of multiple global environmental benefits regarding ecosystem services and thus to be used for local problems and providing in global solutions that was our research paper thank you yeah it was a, a nice uh, uh, presentation kushal and your slides were really uh, very good and uh, with all the images, uh, very nice presentation. Yes, ma'am. One thing, yeah. How did you yes. get the uh, data, uh, Kushal? From which uh, website you get? Uh, as you told, you are uh, concentrating concentrating on Belgaum data. Okay, Belgaum area. How yes, much? How many kilometers of uh, uh, data you have covered? Okay, ma'am. So uh, how as you I get the data. Uh, yes, ma'am. As you, as I mentioned, uh, Copernicus Open Access Hub is the place where we get the satellite images. And uh, when we get those satellite images, they are in the form of hundred square kilometers uh, tiles. And we uh, do you need? Uh, yeah. Do you require any uh, uh, pre uh, thing you need to take uh, yeah, from any bodies, the national bodies? Approval uh, you need to take, or you need to request them to access the data? No, ma'am. It is uh, it's an open access platform. So okay. Uh, we don't need any permission or uh, authentication or uh, any uh, proof that we are doing uh, proper work or we need any uh, certification or okay. any. Uh, that is the reason we have taken this uh, Copernicus open access platform so that it is accessible to anyone. And mainly because environmentalists and farmers uh, don't have access to uh, high quality um, spatial data, we made sure that the satellite images are. Uh, affordable. Okay. How many kilometers you have covered? Uh, Ma'am, we have only made uh, our initial survey on Belgami city. So that yes. is uh, 99 square kilometers. Ma'am. Okay. And uh, did any farmers benefited from the results what you have uh, given now? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, not farmers exactly because because of the pandemic we haven't been able to go out and actually show our survey. But Green Savings, okay. that is the NGO which we collaborated with, they provided us with their prime locations and uh, they wanted us to survey their land to make sure we know they also know how many um, how they are impacting the uh, evergreens map. So we have. Uh, surveyed their land and those four prime locations which I showed and we have provided them with the data and they are really happy with the airport area because they have spent a lot of uh, manpower and energy in those locations. Okay. Nice, yeah. Good. Ah. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, sir. Next we have paper ID 311. Ma'am, I'm giving you the presenter Rights, please present. You can present now, ma'am.
Ma'am, we can't hear any sound from your side. The presentation is visible, but we can't hear sound, ma'am. I think she is muted. Geeta is muted. Uh, am I audible, ma'am? Now. Yes, 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 ma'am. Yes, okay. Is my screen visible, ma'am? Now. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm Geeta, and I'll be presenting our work today to you on behalf of my team. First of all, I would like to thank you for selecting our paper. Uh, title of our paper is "Imparting Quality Education with Practical Approach Using Cloud Computing for Education Case Study." Moving on to agenda. We'll have a quick introduction on purpose and problem statement. Then we'll move on to the methodology uh, uh, with use of a case, use case diagram, class diagram, state chart, and sequence diagram. And we'll quickly uh, brief out the target outcome and implementation, and finally the conclusion. Starting with the introduction, as we know in a traditional system, it is necessary that both student and teacher to be present physically. Whereas in an online education provides this opportunity to learn from anywhere, irrespective of the location. So it is possible for student to study subjects that are physically out of reach. As in if the student want to study the subject that is not offered by any institutions, that is accessible by him or her, the, co the concept of distance education becomes the savior. So to make the online education possible, we came up with an online education portal, which can be developed using cloud computing. Uh, cloud computing, as we know, it is a hub of computational resources, which can be used without owning it. It features like a uh, platform as a service, provides us with the necessary to host such portal. Cloud's advantage of uh, worldwide access make it possible for students to learn from anywhere and for the teacher to teach from anywhere. And narrowing it down on our purpose is to impart better quality education to students by utilizing the current technology uh, to overcome the disadvantage of traditional system. Um, and a problem statement is to build a virtual learning portal using cloud computing to provide quality education to students by the use of online platforms and collaborative tools, bringing a transformative impact, impact in the field of education. And coming on to methodology. Uh, we follow the software development life cycle to develop a prototype of the system. The first step is requirement analysis, in which function, functional requirements are divided into three parts, student side, teacher side, and admin side. In the two, student side, we have register, login, search courses, view ma course materials, assignments and we can give pro progress attendance and can participate in course discussion uh, on the teacher side we have register login upload course materials upload assignments evaluate assignments issue certificate and participate in course discussion and coming on to the admin side we have login database management and paint and uh, payment maintenance and the right hand side you can see the use case diagram with the three uh, actors on the screen, student, teacher, and admin, which describe the use cases uh, mentioned here. And next, moving on to the architectural design, we have used object-oriented approach uh, in, in which it focuses on capturing the structure and behavior of systems into small modules that combines both data and processes. Uh, this is demonstrated by the class diagram class diagram as you can see that the classes that there are uh, registration login teacher student admin and a course these are interconnected by the relationship between them like aggregation association and composition next we have software design uh, which is represented using the state diagram sequence diagram and deployment diagram here we have state 
chart diagram which shows the flow of the process. As you can see, uh, uh, starting with the login with credentials, the student can log in and he can see the uh, list of courses uh, listed on dashboard. And the student can select the course. If it is a free course, he can directly uh, see the course details and uh, go through the course. If it is a pay, payment, uh, like paid course, you have to make the payment first and then can uh, view the course. The same as the student, the teacher also can log in, uh, uh, log in and uh, she can register herself as a teacher to the new course. And a teacher can upload the course materials course materials and assignments, they can create the assignments uh, and uh, student and teacher, they can both participate in online discussion where the student can ask the doubt and teacher can uh, uh, clear the doubts of a student. And parallelly like uh, uh, one, the assignments which are created by the teacher can be accessed by the students and can be submitted. Once the assignments are submitted, the teachers will be uh, uh, evaluate uh, the teachers will evaluate the assignments and upgrade the grades of a student uh, and parallelly they, uh, the progress of the student is upgraded uh, where the student can see his or her progress once the course is completed the certificate is issued uh, this is what the state diagram uh, is next going on to the sequence diagram we have two sequence diagram which describes login and course registration. In login, in login, student or teacher can click on the login button. The request is sent to the server. The server loads the login page and then the user can enter username and password and sends it for val validation to the server. Then the server validates whether the user is registered user. If so, then the dashboard will be loaded or else the home page will be loaded and the user will be asked to register first. And coming on to the second sequence diagram, we have course registration, which will be done by student, uh, where the student can click on the classes um, and the request will be sent to the cloud server and uh, the details of the course uh, listed uh, will be fetched from the cloud database and will be presented to the student. And once the student clicks on the de class details, and uh, the request is sent to the cloud server. Um, the class details uh, co will be accessed from the database and will be sent back to the uh, student. If the student uh, is interested in a particular course, he can uh, click on the register, register for the class so that the request will be sent to the cloud server and uh, the data gets get updated uh, such the particular student is uh, uh, registered for a particular course. Once the registration is successful, the student will be uh, able to receive the message, uh, registration successful. And next, uh, coming to the target outcome. Uh, so far, we have seen the methodology which showed the requirement analysis, various design diagrams for virtual learning portal. We understand that the software engineering is a part and parcel of every software product and every soft, uh, software engineer's life. However, its principal techniques and best practices, it is often categorized as theoretical subject. However, in usage, it is more skill-driven and practice-oriented subject. This work demonstrates the process of imparting software engineering concept by practically showing the case, following the case study. So, um, groups, uh, groups of students were given a case study to analyze and identify problem statement, requirements, process model, and design. So basically to follow the software development life cycle to develop a working product. So this activity gives the student to, to an opportunity to apply the concept of a software engineering that he is obtained in the classrooms. So the case study in this particular work is virtual learning portal for education in which we identify the agile process model as the best suited for this case study because the requirements of this case is always prone to change updates based on the user feedback or update updations in the software itself so this activity has uh, led to develop a basic prototype in accordance with the software development life cycle so next coming on to the implementation on the right hand side you can see the deployment diagram of the virtual portal 
the deployment diagram is a uml diagram that shows the execution architecture of a system employing all the hardware and software involved in this diagram you can see that there is having user having a pc or mobile that has a browser support this connects to the server where the website is hosted via http request message in the server in Yes, Geeta, we are not able to hear you. Neha, can you check? Uh, what is the issue? Geeta, are you there? When the slides are not moving and uh, i think we have some network issue at her end we'll wait for some time and uh, then we'll switch over to the next yeah one. we'll wait for another one minute okay we will check gita you can ping us if you are available on chat Neha, you send her a message if you have an access. Yeah, we have been doing it. Ma'am, let's move to the next. Uh, if we get her back, then probably you can ask her questions. But we, let us move to the next presentation. Uh, yeah, yeah. Aishwarya, please get the other presenter. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so, paper ID 344, uh, it's Aishwarya. Um, I'm making as a presenter now. You can go, go ahead. Aishwarya? Aishwarya, can you hear us? Yes, ma'am. Ma one second, ma'am. Okay. I sure you have are you having some trouble? Can move to next uh, presenter, Neha. Sorry, ma'am. Yeah, you can move to next presenter. Hello. I think Raghu Raman is ready, I think. Ashwarya, are you ready? Paper ID 344. Uh, are you ready to present? Yes, ma'am. Is it visible? Uh, no, your uh, screen is. I can see your video, but uh, I can't see your slides. Can you please uh, check on it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
you can close your video if you're having bandwidth issues and please move to presentation yes Ma'am, is it visible? Yes, yes, it's visible. Yeah. Can I start now? Yeah, you can start now. So, good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to you all. My name is Aishwarya Rathi. And I am going to present here about women's self-defense device. It really feels great to operate with a guide and a team member that is so self-reliant and motivated. So this uh, presentation we have done under the guidance of uh, Jayashree ma'am. So I am delighted to be here to tell you about the topic women's self-defense device. Contents, ma'am, is it audible? Yes, you're audible. Go ahead. So, these are the contents. We will understand about introduction, literature survey, proposed architecture, implementation, and final conclusion. So, women's safety has become a suspected subject in India. The safety of women matters a lot, whether it is at home, outside the home, or at any work. Some of Ashwarya, can you come close to the microphone? Your voice is a little low. Yes, ma'am. Some of the previous crimes against women, especially rape cases, were horrific and frightening. Due to such crimes, women's safety has become a suspected subject in India. It has become a major issue in India. Uh, it is becoming a major problem in the development and progress of the country. So, mobile phone is one of the most commonly used gadget. Obviously, everyone is using mobile phone nowadays. Uh, for contacting police friends and we can use mobile phone in any emergency situations and it is like a weapon for protection uh, against any crimes uh, there is no chance of welfare of the world unless the condition of women is improved uh, swami vivekananda once quoted on women government that there is no chance of the welfare of the world unless the condition of women is improved it is not possible for a book bird to fly on one wing so we proposed a device which is low cost easy maintenance and easy to carry our main focus is to propose a device in extensive or wide ranging productions so that not even a single woman should feel unsafe while being alone or going out alone 
so we proposed which is portable easily uh, and can be easily maintained so we will move on to the next slide literature survey here we have uh, focused on three main sur literature surveys and in first author proposed a smart belt by embedding arduino board and pressure sensor into it so it resembles as a normal belt uh, author just embedded a arduino board and pressure sensor so that the device gets activated automatically when the threshold of a pressure when the threshold value of a pressure a sensor crosses next in second author proposed device as a band uh, which is portable which is self activated and augmented with three sensors uh, they have augmented various sensors like temperature sensor pulse rate sensor and motion sensor these three sensors are augmented in a uh, portable device as a band in third author proposed a scheme to identify the victim's location by using image metadata through gps mapper victim's location are provided using image and video by acquiring background, background metadata so here the author proposed uh, a, a to author proposed a scheme uh, which is useful to identify the victim's location uh, in the form of longitude and latitude by using uh, image metadata this uh, all will be possible when gps mapper is built so they can get what is happening uh, uh, in what is happening there Uh, in victim situation, uh, the image and video can be recorded through GPS mappers. Next, uh, proposed architecture. So this is a block diagram of a women's self-defense device system. Uh, first, uh, Arduino. This Arduino Uno board, microcontroller Atmega 320S 28 is embedded in a Arduino Uno board, and these further are connected to LCD display 16 cross 2. Uh, and buzzer, uh, buzzer, and GSM and GPS. This uh, and uh, here we have used three uh, various sensors: pulse sensor, touch sensor, and vibration sensor. Uh, we will discuss this about in next section uh, about sensors. And uh, two main uh, emergency keys are uh, embedded in this device. Uh, one is emergency key on watch. and another will be on self defense board so there will be two keys next we will move on to the components so five components five main components are used here microcontroller atmega 328 gsm gps module lcd display 16 cross 2 and buzzer so in microcontroller atmega 328 is used uh, it we can upload new code to it without the use of any external hardware programmer so this is easy and next gsm is used uh, because uh, we can insert sim card as all know that uh, sim card is inserted in gsm module and the uh, it is uh, mainly used for uh, sending and receiving the sms data or messages and the main advantage is extensive coverage next uh, gps module uh, this is used for uh, tracking the location of a person object entity Uh, this provides us nav navigation and the main advantage is it increases security next lcd display 16 cross 2 obviously it is used in a wide variety of applications it is an electronic display and buzzer buzzer uh, uh, this uh, is an alarming beep sound this is an alarming beep sound to the surrounding area as victim can get help from the nearby so as it make noise uh, periodically uh, the nearby people can come and save the victim next uh, the three main sensors as i have seen in block diagram uh, touch sensor pulse sensor and vibration sensor uh, in the right side of the slide we can see the pictures and in touch sensor uh, the touch sensor is mainly used to capture and record the physical touch on a person it can record all the physical touch of a person which the attacker is uh, doing and uh, the victim is going through and it is also known as touch detector as it uh, detects and captures all the uh, physical touch pulse sensor is used to measure heartbeat rate 
it is also known as plug and play sensor and vibration sensor is used here this is the flexible sensor and it is used for measuring the changes in acceleration strain force etc next uh, we will move on to the women safety app so many applications have built and the main four applications are uh, life 360 indian sos women safety sister app and wit app uh, though they uh, their features are same but some of the advantages are different like description in life 360 it is a family locator uh, application uh, which lets the user to share the location uh, which the victim can share their location to the family members this protects and connects your family the main advantage is uh, it uh, sends messages periodically to the registered number next indian sos women safety this application helps to protect women from emergency situations uh, advantage is user can able to modify they can edit the messages uh, as per their requirement and they can send to the uh, their uh, means they can send to their contacts next sister app this application used by women which helps in location tracking system this is also the application which can be helped in tracking the location and it is quite easy to use as it can be used by everyone with you app with you app this application is used to alert the women's family or guardians by pressing the buzzer button sms as a location uh, will be sent to the registered contact after every 2 minutes so uh, sms will be sent in every 2 minutes so as to alert the guardians or family friends relatives anybody etc this application provides updates of crime scenes happens in india it is like the news updater they can provide all the uh, crime scenes updates uh, which are happening next this is uh, a ishwarya paper id 344 can you can you please start the conclusion yeah so this is the result just a summary uh, just by pressing an emergency a message in danger will be sent to the registered number women can also press buzzer as to alert surrounding people and can get help from them another button will be pressed after clicking this button it is used uh, to send the location women can keep her finger intention is mainly to provide the large scale production of this device so that anyone can carry this device like school children drivers women etc in addition to this we can embed a camera and a voice recognition module in a watch so that it captures and records all the images and voice spoken by victim will be sent prospectively to the registered numbers and future scope this can be used to by any children safety purpose like it yeah sure yeah yeah your time is up yeah uh, have you built any prototype of the device ashwarya yes. yeah have you built any prototype of the device what you are explained uh, 
how much did it cost? It is uh, like fifteen thousand. Fifteen thousand. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Nice. Uh, nice, Ashwarya. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. We'll move to the next uh, presenter. Uh, I think Neha, you can give chance to Veena for completion of her uh, uh, thing. Geeta, I think. Yeah, Geeta. Ma'am, do you want to take her at the end or right away? Uh, just right now, you finish it off, uh, Hasna. Okay. No? Okay. Just only the conclusion part was left. Ashwarya, can you uh, add it? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Paper ID 311, uh, you can present now. I have made you as a presenter. Yes, ma'am. You tell us just two minutes for conclusion. Yes, ma'am. I'll just find you. Yes. Okay, so to conclude my paper, uh, we, our paper brings out the virtual teaching method following a case study approach. As a famous proverb says, I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, I do and I understand. By developing a project with software development lifecycle gives us a typical software engineer experience. And overall outcome of this case study brings us a better team. So, um, am I audible? Yes, yes, you are audible. Yes, you are audible. Go okay. Um, better team building and experience the entire lifecycle of a product development. In scenario like today's COVID-19 pandemic, uh, where modes of teaching are rapidly switched to online portals, student teacher and uh, teacher uh, student uh, student student interactions are on decrease. Hence, it is a growing need to explore and identify new techniques to impact quality education to students. So this was a conclusion of the paper, and thank you, ma'am. Okay, Gita, you've done a case study, right? Uh, regarding this, have you yes. interviewed any of the faculty side? Uh, is there any flaws in the uh, virtual systems what they are using for teaching? Did you interview any of the faculties or from students? Uh, did you take any inputs from their end? Is there any flaws in the uh, software life cycle of the virtual teaching? Uh, uh, no, ma'am. Like we didn't uh, find like we, have, we didn't look into any flaws in the current uh, online portal. Okay, just okay. In future, you can add a uh, few things. So for comparison, uh, definitely there will be some uh, flaws or some requirements, more requirements from the teachers end as well as students end. You could uh, just stop that and if you add in, if it is a open source, if it is a possible, adding that mm. teacher would be great. Yeah? As a software engineer, I wanted to suggest mm. to you. Yes, I will take the feedback from the faculty or the student base and we will look into the future development. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, thank That's you. Much. Yes, thank you, ma'am. Paper ID 357. I have made it of the presenter now. Uh, sir, can you please check on your audio? Uh, yeah, uh, good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. It's clear. Thank you. Um, a lot of noise. Yeah. Yeah. background noise. Just, uh, okay, I'll, I'll come as close as possible to the microphone. Is it uh, any better now? Yeah. Okay, you're able to uh, see my first screen? Yes, you can go ahead. Sir. Okay. Okay, my pronounced session chair, Dr. Vijay Lakshmi, and to the BHTC organizers and of course the participants who are listening in. And my name is uh, Raghu Raman and I'm from Amrita Vishwavidya Peetam, Amrita Puri here in Kerala. And my co-authors for this paper are also listed. It's quite a multidisciplinary team. We have a School of Business, School of Engineering, uh, Center for Wireless Networks. And, and such is the, uh, the concept behind this paper, which is uh, you know, how do we investigate uh, what motivates uh, 
our business graduates to adopt experiential learning programs. And in this particular case, the experiential learning program that we're talking is called uh, Living Labs. And I'll, I'll speak more about this as I go along. Uh, just a quick background on the on the program itself, and uh, before I uh, talk about the research study, uh, basically this is a Amrita Living Labs is a multidisciplinary experiential learning program uh, that uh, that integrates research, development, and uh, deployment of sustainable solutions uh, for rural communities in in India. And the idea is how do we bring together Amrita students, Amrita faculty and also uh, international students and international faculties can they go live in these uh, rural communities uh, anywhere from two weeks to almost up to uh, six months and then and how they come up with uh, solutions for their uh, challenges which are in the most sustainable way and before the students uh, head out to these rural communities which are uh, spread across india you know, they receive an orientation about the, the village or the community that they are going to visit, their culture. And most importantly, what are some existing challenges that they have? If it's an existing project, we have a, an excellent documentation of what has been already done and then what needs to be improved upon. And if it is a new challenge, then, then we pull them up. So a, a considerable time goes in preparing the students so that when they are at the village location, uh, they, are, they are very uh, productive. And subsequently, the students will design, test, and implement an affordable and sustainable solutions by very closely working with the community. And that is the crux of it. You know, you try to live with them and see what the challenges are and come up with solutions. And in most of the areas that we are focusing on, as you can see, energy, water, health, hygiene, education, livelihood, waste management, uh, these are all very closely related to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Of course, our biggest inspiration for uh, this project comes from our uh, Chancellor, Sri Mata Amrita my Devi, and uh, Amma has been very keen and that you know our students, all of them go live in the village communities. And in fact, it's a mandatory program with the Amrita that all the students have to go live in the village communities for at least about uh, two weeks over the two year or a three year degree program. And then uh, this is Amma herself working on, on some of those things. And uh, a quick background on what is uh, Roger's uh, diffusion of innovation theory, which is what is being used uh, to study and what motivates our students or what will motivate the students to, to go to villages and, and adopt and design solutions. And this is a sociological theory. You know, Everett Rogers is a, is a professor of communication studies and he popularized this theory in his uh, uh, seminal work on diffusion of innovations book and uh, this book is now in this fifth edition, a little over 120,000 citations, and is an acknowledged authority when it comes to, um, you know, how do we um, uh, are able to predict an adoption of a new product or a service. You know, if you look at any of the um, existing product marketing strategies, whether it's a high tech company like an Intel or a Wipro or an Infosys, uh, TCS, anytime they are looking at introducing new products, new solutions, new services, and uh, Roger's theory is, is pretty much like the basis of you know predicting the adoption. There. And uh, very at a high level, you know the the key components of um, his theory are. You know there are there is an innovation and, and that has got five attributes and I'll, I'll explain in the next slide a little bit more detail and the five attributes are relative advantage compatibility and complexity trialability and observability and is the innovation being you know a, a top driven or it's a collective or it's an optional you know all of us were mandated to uh, install our or you say to app. And so that was an authoritative kind of a decision or, or no collectively people decide whether I should use it or not, or it remains an option. So each one of them has an impact on how well uh, the, the new product or the solution will be adopted by the potential adopters. And then, you know, the communication uh, channels, you know, through which we are communicating right now, of course, and the social media has taken over, but the word of mouth continues to be 
uh, the, the biggest promoter of, you know, you hear from your friend and the family about something and that has the most credible uh, uh, source of information. And then you go further check in social media. So how do we communicate? And of course, the last one is, is the change agent. You know, who is telling about that product or a solution? And these are uh, opinion leaders. You, you look up to them and then a word of praise or an appreciation comes about the product or a solution. And you feel, well, he or she is telling me uh, it must be a good one. So this is broadly his theory saying that, you know, how uh, human beings uh, adopt uh, new products and new solutions internally, they go through this uh, decision making process. And this is his uh, theoretical framework. In our paper, we, we pretty much focused on the attributes of the innovation itself. As I said, Amrita Living Labs is a very a unique practice of sending students to live in the rural communities and hence it qualifies to be a new practice or, or a new um, a process and so we looked at you know what is an advantage of this one you know what is uh, how much is this advantageous over anything that is already existing and uh, is, is it compatible with what the students are already doing you know you, you don't you don't change your Samsung phone to an iPhone just like that. You know, you are so much comfortable with your Samsung phone. And only if you find that there is enough compatibility, then you pick up the next phone there. So compatibility is very important. Then, of course, you know how easy it is for you to adopt something. If that is going to require you a lot of training, you cannot transfer your data from one system to another, you are not going to. So the ease of use or a complexity of a new product or a solution is very important. And you would also like to see if you can try it out. You know, can I can I just try it out for two days and five days and see how it works? Once I'm comfortable, then I will I'll fully adopt that one. So that is another attribute of an innovation, the trialability. And of course, if you are not able to try, but if you are able to see someone else using it and you are able to observe it, and that also is, is, a, is a reference data point for you, whether you should go with a solution. So this is these are broadly attributes of innovation, any anything, high tech, low tech, agriculture based, that he felt uh, an internal decision making process happens here. I'll briefly, um, and so so our our hypothesis was uh, a living labs, which is a new idea, a new practice, and in this case, the adopting unit was uh, where our MBA students, so it qualified to be an innovation, and could we go to the next step of uh, you know applying those uh, attributes and see if we are able to predict if the students are going to adopt this or not. And then we chose the graduate students of the business program as adopters. And I'll explain, you know, why would we pick up business students for this one? Why not masters of social work or, or some of those students who are anyway aligned to these kind of programs? A quick look at the uh, literature. Um, there is a lot that has been said about service learning and an experiential learning. And, but the idea here is that live-in concept, you know, how you are going to live in the community work with the community and then collaboratively develop. You don't develop something in your labs and then go try to sell it to them. And that model doesn't work. Only when you live and interact and coexist with them, you have a much a deeper uh, a grasp on you know, what needs to be. And that is where we felt uh, this kind of a program is very unique and there is not enough literature that covers that aspect of it. And then why we picked up business programs, you know, in general, business students are very career oriented and they're, they are looking to make that jump from uh, wherever they are into the next big one and they see MBA as an opportunity to do that. And we wanted to try it out um, our, our research study under uh, the management of the MBA folks there. And typically today, the management curriculum is not uh, sufficient to build that applied knowledge. You know, you are doing 126 credits. You are pretty much in your in your classroom and your campus, and uh, you step out of it at the end of two years, and and that is not enough. That doesn't build the social skills. It only builds the domain specific skills like you know finance and 
and social media and in digital marketing, but how do you build those social interpersonal skills? So the research gaps that we- Raghu sir? Yes. Uh, Raghu sir, your time is exceeding. Uh, can you start concluding now? Uh, yeah, uh, conclusion. Okay. Okay, so very quickly, this is our uh, research model and what we felt is those attributes of innovation, they positively affect the student's intention to adopt it. And this is our sample size of about 100 MBA students. They spent about nine days. Uh, we performed the reliability analysis to make sure you know, our questionnaire is reliable according to Chromebacks Alpha. And basically, um, we, uh, the conclusion says, you know, uh, out of the five attributes, the ease of use, relative advantage, and compatibility, uh, they were the ones they were able to predict. If this new product solution was easy to use, easy to adopt, and the students were very uh, happy to go with it, the trialability or observability was not really something that uh, they were very keen. But they were very keen on the department support. Once they felt that the department is fully behind them, and, and I think that is something that was seen as very positive by the students. Do my teachers appreciate my going to the living, live in uh, rural communities? That they were very keen. So in conclusions, what we are saying is, you know, the students pursuing MBA degrees, they tend to be career oriented, but somewhere they also cherish the desire to develop personally as well as socially. And experiential programs like Amrita Live-In Labs have the great potential to address such personal and altruistic uh, desires. I think the curriculum prepares the future managers, but the decisions are having increasingly important societal and environmental impact. You now we can pretty much see what is happening with the, with the COVID situation there, where you know the pandemic is telling us how we look at this life so totally differently. And of course, it is a nature's protective reaction to heal herself. But I think we don't want to miss this opportunity. And so we believe programs like you know the living labs are also about creating that awareness to live in harmony with, with nature. Thank you very much. Pronounced to all of you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Raghuraman, uh, nice presentation and giving us an exposure of uh, uh, about the living labs. Okay, it is a nice uh, uh, exposure for MBA students. Just it is a WE track. With a curiosity, I'm asking you, uh, was there any problems identified in the rural case and have any women become an entrepreneur out of uh, having this uh, exposure of a live-in labs? Is there an example there? Yes, yes, pretty much. In fact, um, the uh, one of the vertical in this program has to do with quality education and we have set up close to I would say about 42 uh, rural education centers uh, and, and across those 12 to 13 different states in which we have adopted these villages and there where the women themselves are, are running the um, this uh, rural education centers there. And they have been taught uh, to, to teach this uh, school dropout students as well. So I would say by and large, uh, they are very much involved. And there is also a set of uh, entrepreneurs, which is kind of for livelihood uh, business incubator program. The government heard about our program and said, why don't we set up a livelihood business? So women themselves uh, are driving those mm -hmm. as well. So both in the quality education and lively business work, that's a very high percentage of women involved. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paper ID three, paper ID three six seven. Is there off? I have made you as a presenter. Now you can start presenting. Thank you so much, Aishwarya. Uh, I'll just share my screen. Just let me know if you can see my presentation. Yeah, you're audible. Is my screen? Yeah. Yes, it is visible. Thank you so much. Yeah. <clears throat> Good afternoon, one and all. Thank you for uh, having me here. Myself, Vidya Rao, under the guidance of Dr. Preva Kevi, Madam, here to present a uh, uh, paper real time network attack weather monitoring device using Kali Linux. 
my agenda goes as follows introduction motivation real time setup explanation experimental setup system response to various attacks and conclusion with the future work followed by references coming to introduction we all from past three days attending the conference we all are talking about a lot of smart networks smart data for agriculture for transport for hospital for security management there are a lot of applications that's running on internet just to make a city smart we are using internet which is a public channel to be communicated when there are a lot of devices connected on internet we have a lot of issue with respect to security and privacy concern of these devices because these devices are more accessible to the attacker or a hacker who can just uh, just hack the devices and extract the data as well as these devices are resource constrained thereby the it is so far what the research has been happen it has been there are proper lot of lightweight security protocols using electric cryptography to secure these data generation points as these data generation points are having huge number of data every second it is very important to make sure that every bit of that is been transmitted from every device is been secure so no malfunctioning of the devices as well as there is no alteration of the data that has been transmitted so what has happened through the course of research which has come through my research also we have seen that a lot of um, simulation tools are used to check the security or authenticity of that particular protocol proposed by the researcher hence what we have done we have actually proposed a protocol it's already uh, been published also the right now we thought of executing it on a real time and checking the security strength of our particular work so motivation is there is no real time evaluation of any of the security protocol has been proposed so far people are actually going towards simulation tools like aviswa proverb and simulating the environment simulating the attacks and checking whether the particular protocol or algorithm is secure or not so the lightweight hashing method is our proposed work it is already published and the lightweight digital signature algorithm is a proposed by lavana et al we have taken these two as a uh, two protocols to execute the real time attack because they both are running using electric curve digital signature based algorithm and both use a different hashing method called blake 2b at the same time both have actually customized the blake hash function to their requirement and we have executed and we have done the experiment so the main motivation is to perform a real time security attack on a device to check the, the to check the uh, performance so coming to the real time setup this was a, a right side you can see that this is a, small, a raspberry pi based device that we have made it as a um, device that, co that collects the environmental data like temperature humidity and carbon dioxide composition from the air that is nothing but the raspberry pi is coupled with two sensors that is dht11 and dht135 dht11 sensor it senses two type of data that is uh, 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 sorry, the temperature as well as humidity and mq135 actually it, it senses many many of the gases but we have to collect only carbon dioxide composition and this entire work was experimental for different types of we had made the data to send at 60 per second as 120th second and signal like done still for 10 minutes of data because any and, and environment data what they actually collect data for every 10 minutes so that they can process the data so what we have done we have done the same setup for two different we have done the attack setup for two different uh, case studies for one is a three raspberry pi based setup is done and other one is we use ubuntu devices to actually make uh, real time attack for scalable system so to see that the top portion of this figure 3 will tell a raspberry pi based setup wherein on the left side we can see a server so again a raspberry pi based server on the right side we can see the client machine again a raspberry pi client machine in between we can see an attacker it is also running on a, ras a raspberry pi we are using uh, the kali linux based attacker machine because kali linux is a linux that is particularly used for penetration testing or ethical hacking a similar setup was done for scalability check also where we have actually executed entire work on a laboratory purpose having almost 5 10 and 15 dif different client with one single server for different number of attackers i'll explain in future uh, coming to actually we are experimental setup uh, as i said experiment that i just explained before this is nothing but we are experiment was conducted for three different attacks for iot based network that is man in the middle attack replay attack and denial of service attack uh, for any attacker to be performed by any uh, hacker or attacker 
he has to make sure he's been morphing his identity for that purpose we're using the ip config at zero promise that makes you makes the attacker to be in a pernicious mode so that the nobody can know that he is listening to the communication so below table one shows the different pi and what is the ip addresses we are not given ip address complete just because of the security purpose of the institution and then coming to the mitm attack mitm attack is done basically using arp spoofing method arp spoof arp spoofing is actually a tool in kali linux used to perform different different attacks but mitm is used for mitm attack in this we can see arp minus in uh, sorry initially the target machine opens three terminals it can tell t1 t2 t3 uh, wherein each terminal the uh, there are different commands to be executed on the first terminal the uh, the, uh, the attacker will tell he is the client to the server second terminal will tell he is the server to the client so that he is making a pipeline connection between the client and server through him then he is going to ip forward whatever packages of ip package is coming is forwarded and finally, is going to DNF step. Once he start DNF sniffing, he can know what is happening, what has been communicated between these two devices. Second is replay attack. For a replay attack, what we have, we have specifically written a Python based scripting that captures a message sent by the client and this sends to server. What happens at packet T1 time, packet is sent from client to server, but at the same time, packet is actually captured by the uh, attacker or a Kali, Kali machine at T1, m second, T1 time and is sent to the uh, server at the T2 time. So the replay attack method is capturing the packet, reading and resending to the server. But how server responds, I'll tell you in future. And this is a DOS attack, that is the denial of service attack. It's a majorly flood-based attack. We're using this HP ping sync flooding attack. This is a command is going to tell. Here actually we are, we are transmitting almost 500 packages with a window size of 64 from the port 80, that is TCP port, port 80. And in what format? It's a flooding format. Randomly, you are taking a random IP addresses and sending packets to this source ID. This ID is nothing but the server ID. So how once this entire final packet is bombarded on the server, server, how it for response? This is the response for uh, this LXPNA system response to various attack. For MITM attack, as I said, once the DNF sniff is done, as soon as we can, we can check what's happening in the Wireshark machine. In Wireshark machine, you can see there are various number of IP addresses and is sending to the server. Server is able to sniff. But even though when it is sniffing the data, he is unable to decrypt it because entire message has been encrypted using that LWDSA and LWDS, LWH uh, algorithms. So it is difficult to extract even when MITM attack is being done. So this for system response for a replay attack, as I said, a Python script is being done where the data is being uh, uh, captured from the server, sorry, uh, captured from the client and sent to server. Once it is done, we can see that as when the server gets a duplicated message, he is going to disconnect the connection that is coming from the that particular device. Uh, and the third, uh, this is something that we are actually performing so, uh, replay attack for the 5, 10, and 15 different clients with 1, 2, and 3 attacker machine, for, both for LWHM and LWDSA. We, see, we could see that our proposed LWHM was responding to the attack more faster than the LWDSA in all the three cases. Next is the US attack. We told, as I said, there are final packages that is being bombarded onto the server. Once it is ex, ex, when there is exceeded number of packet received received at the server port, it is going to disconnect itself. So once the when we checked for the 5, 10, 15 machine, we had we could do only two for one set of Kali machine because we were using three different Kali machines to perform DOS attack. There was an issue of the device getting hacked. So what we did, we just took one attacker, one server, and five, 10, 15 different sets of clients for performing the uh, DOS attack. In that also, we could make sure that LWHN could actually perform more faster than with respect to LWDSA. To conclude that, we can say that on a real-time platform, we could uh, we actually did a weather monitoring system, which can be used, which this particular can be used either weather monitoring system or any of the smart application that reinvolves our internet as a communication medium and it is more prone for data generated, more sensitive data generated. So that it is better to do a real time attack to check whether the device is being really um, uh, secured or not. So we could make sure that LWHM and LWS were performed on this weather monitoring system for attacks like MITM, replay, and DOS attack. And through the experiment, we could make sure that the proposed LWHM was responding to the attacks more faster than the LWDSA. 
and you can always tell that based on light lightweight schemes, uh, the LWHM is more feasible for resource constraint devices with respect to security also with respect to data transmission also. In further, we have thought of ex expanding the work on a larger IoT devices across the uh, our campus actually and performing different type of attacks like 4G attack, human cyber text attack, plain text attack and so on real, on a real time scenario. And these are the have been referred for the performance of this particular uh, work and uh, thank you so much. Yeah, nice uh, video. Thank uh, you. Yeah. yeah, here is one question. Sure. Uh, is it a cloud based you have done or a LAN no. based? No, we have done using a Wi-Fi based network in the device in the in, the, in our lab only, ma'am. Uh, where we are actually connected some initially we connected only three devices where we had on three Raspberry Pi communicating on a Wi-Fi. We are actually use a basic hotspot as a Wi-Fi communication medium because all of the IoT devices communicate on, on internet or Wi-Fi is majorly. So we just tried for a Wi-Fi based network wherein we could make it communicate. We, we initially yeah. we, we perform it internet also. After internet we move to Wi-Fi also now. Uh, one more thing, yeah, the sure. user, will be, yeah, user will be getting any message uh, uh, like your system is uh, hacked kind of a, uh, a notification is be given. Uh, have you made is, this is this is what work we have I explained so far it is based on server based map. Server gets sure. to whether the, the, the transmission the communication is hacked or not. So once the, once the server feels the communication is hacked, he will get a message. So that time he will intimate to the uh, a particular device which actually connected sending the device. Message, oh. yeah connected device that oh. it is being oh. uh, replaced or again uh, the message is being again sent a similar one or like that so oh. he will again make sure that it is not being uh, it is uh, restart the communication with server mode so that he will be again oh. authenticated server okay how much it will cost uh, the device hardware what you have developed um actually a single raspberry pi is almost two and a half to three thousand rupees and those two sensors will not cost more than 400 rupees, ma'am. So entire setup to one client, we took almost from four and a half to 5,000 rupees. But the same thing we can do with us to the Arduino boards also, but it requires different uh, external Wi-Fi modules to be done. But Raspberry has an Arduino board, so we do not embedded, need to embedded. worry about yeah, embedded system. So that is what we did. Okay, we nice. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am, thank you so much. Thank you. Madam, uh, you are audible. <laughs> your voice is not clear it's breaking hello 
we have lot of uh, techniques for doing the prediction of uh, diseases one of them is heart disease but in those systems uh, those are like completely uh, technical only the uh, people who know the language or technique they'll understand it so they are uh, here the uh, uh, your effort is to make it available to the common person like our work provides a web based framework for predicting the heart disease using machine learning algorithms with very good accuracy compared to the other works it is because even for the uh, ordinary person also they have a internet access so if you make this uh, portal available for even the uh, ordinary patient then it will be uh, useful here ensemble classification methods are used used for predicting the heart disease ensemble classification methods are nothing but here we we'll use combination so cover the introduction the main factors for heart disease are uh, age that is uh, very old people aged people get this heart disease easily and uh, uh, compared to in gender means uh, like uh, more men are more prone to heart disease uh, people having uh, smoking habits family history um, high cholesterol who are uh, having very bad uh, diet patterns uh, who are having high uh, blood pressure uh, very high body mass index who do alcohol intake and who don't do physical exercise those are the main factors uh, for the heart disease these are identified according to world health organization statistics every year almost 17 million people die because of the heart problems so and uh, there is a need of anticipation cares for fundamental for protecting individuals and the use of uh, data mining strategies reduce examination time errors and they improve the performance of clinical experts and they also uh, give some uh, sound proof like uh, what they are going in the correct they are going in the correct direction or not they help them to propose the appropriate medicine also so here this work Uh, uses ensemble methods for classification purpose to detect the heart disease it predicts the test data like a patient state as he is having a heart disease or not so that uh, it is full for the uh, patient as well as doctor to diagnose it early uh, if he is having any symptoms like that then go in lo Research, researchers have worked on this prediction of heart disease uh, data mining techniques uh, many have proved that ensemble strategies like bagging boosting are improving the accuracy of weak classifiers which are nothing but uh, which are not giving the good accuracy and one or two frameworks are developed with the new base approach uh, which is giving an 86% of accuracy and uh, many have uh, built uh, iot tools Uh, using nearest neighbors distance and neighbors algorithms and they see some in improvement in the performance and uh, if you have work like by combining the different uh, data sets from different sources when you take it now uh, uh, it increases the accuracy like uh, and uh, and studies done on heart disease prediction using uh, knn but uh, they have done the prediction without using the body mass index and uh, smoking habit like that is the lifestyle of the person they do uh, take uh, alcohol they have the smoking habit they have good diet patterns they do physical activity or not those are all secondary factors which also affect the heart presence of the heart disease the proposed work the data set is taken from the kaggle in well attributes age gender height weight um, uh, uh, systolic uh, blood pressure diastolic blood pressure cholesterol glucose smoking habit alcoholic habit and the activities the uh, physical activity is uh, activity or not it is sir yes or no will give here for smoking alcohol also uh, one means uh, person pay, uh, person smokes so zero is person 
it's not true and for glucose and cholesterol we have three ranges uh, normal above normal well above normal and uh, oh, cardio 12th attribute is cardio which is the label actually in the uh, taken data set uh, the patient is having heart or not this consists of 300 Out of 300 patients, if you see the first uh, line chart in which it is, we can make sure it's a main factor for uh, heart disease. If we can see that people uh, who are in the age of range 51 to 60 are higher prone to heart disease compared to the people who are in the age of 41 to 50. And people who are or less chances of getting the heart disease. So likewise, we can say that uh, people having higher age are more prone to heart disease. And because cholesterol is a major uh, factor for uh, heart disease. In the data set, uh, we have uh, almost above 50 people who had uh, well above normal cholesterol and almost 50 people had uh, normal range and uh, uh, almost thirty. Okay, two classifiers are used: uh, random forest and a support vector machine. Uh, what is random forest? Is it is by using many decision. Here, what we do is we take the data set with that we divide it into multiple subsets. From each sub data set, we generate one data uh, decision tree. From the decision tree, we'll do the majority voting. For example, for decision tree, it's class as zero, and in decision two, it is class as zero, and decision three, class as one. Here, two trees are given majority zero, so the second class is as one as so that is the random forest. Suppose we have the concept of hyper. Here, what we here we think with two different classes by a higher plane or a plane. We uh, uh, and uh, the equation of the line which separates two classes is given by a x i plus b, and its value is equal to when the date point they lie on the origin, and uh, if uh, it is greater than or equal to 1, that means they lie at the margin. Uh, that, and if it is greater than or equal to 1, then data points lie below the margin. Classify reason for doing the prediction because uh, when we do the testing of individual classifiers, it is giving highest uh, accuracy. So in the voting classifier, combination of uh, consolidation of these two classifiers are taken to give the better accuracy because it is proved already that by using uh, ensemble method, by using different combination of methods, we get the good accuracy. To talk about the system architecture, this portal is built by using random forest and a support vector algorithm. Here, a lot of user interfaces, like uh, we have a uh, through which uh, doctors, uh, lab assistants, or medical staff, admins, patients can log in. They just create a login account and view their details. Here, there is an opportunity for the patient to communicate directly with the doctor. So, hence, it helps sometimes, like for the patient when he's not available uh, physically, means so he go to hospital in case of medical staff or someone he is there, do the prediction, then uh, doctor can decide the what needs to be done. This software, uh, Python, Angular, uh, SQL, table, and framework. Here in the system architecture, first we read the data set, then we good selection, then we split the 
split the data set into train and uh, test data set then we build the model by method then um, uh, uh, someone logins to portal like admin doctor patient or medical staff uh, medical staff or uh, doctor can enter the data uh, into the system once they enter it will go to the model then uh, we do the prediction after doing the prediction like uh, patient has uh, heart disease that is stored in the database the future uh, like uh, they can log in and view it and after viewing that uh, prediction result it is can be viewed by both patient they can uh, generate the uh, report like uh, even admin also has the facility for generating the report like who all has are having the heart disease in what gender uh, all those things to talk about the uh, before taking this uh, support vector machine and uh, random forest individual uh, accuracy is for for decision tree it was giving 72 for uh, k nearest neighbor it was 74 and for the spm we got the 90 for random forest it is 92 and uh, when we do the voting classifier it and uh, the below is the profile view of how a report looks like this report can be here we can see uh, details of uh, patient's height his blood pressure whether he has uh, smoking habit he has uh, uh, he takes alcohol all the things and the last attribute we can see here uh, cardio it is showing it as uh, negative so that means patient does not have um, heart disease and uh, once you see here we have provided an option for sending the message uh, through which uh, this option is provided for both patient uh, and doctor to provide a transparent channel, uh, channel between patient and doctor Uh, this is how it uh, helps the patient and uh, gives him uh, confidence like patient uh, whatever they are communicating is uh, true and directly he is talking to the doctor and uh, to talk about the accuracy of the model uh, the precision recall and f1 score are the um, can be used for measuring the accuracy of the model precision is nothing but how many selected items are relevant to, and uh, and recall is how many relevant items we have selected here if we have high precision and recall means model will be good so without uh, patients without cardio for that we got the precision of 0.91 and for the 0.96 f1 score which is harmonic mean of this precision and recall for that we got an accuracy of 0.9 and for the with cardio uh, and heart problem we got the precision of 0.97 and for uh, recall it is 0.92 and uh, harmonic mean of history when you take it is 0.9 so hence uh, it's clear that uh, compared to the existing systems system provides an heart disease prediction model plus it provides an online portal so we can use both the combinations to which can be easily made available to a audience and so then so hence the proposed work uh, it builds an application to detect the presence of heart disease using combination of uh, svm and random forest and it provides transparent channel between doctor and patient and uh, available and it provides uh, uh, opportunity patient communicate with the doctor to videos and different uh, doctor can also communicate directly so lab assistant can get to and uh, this uh, application can be enhanced uh, for future uh, by uh, implementing the same for other kind of diseases like uh, cancer diabetes other so that's how our system help uh, some some extent for the doctor in the rn for uh, reducing the death rate as we as the number of people will become aware of this heart disease and about this uh, web portal uh, they uh, the chance of death rate can be reduced thank you okay savita your uh, yeah presentation was good uh, here is one question 
uh, how is the, your uh, output is validated? Is there any uh, doctors are validating it? Your voice is breaking. How accurate performing and this with the two doctors giving good results. Okay. Then how many samples did you try? For testing it, madam. I have yeah. I have taken doctor money. Okay. Okay, Savi. Okay. Sorry, yeah, 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 it's fine. And you can call the next uh, presenter. Uh, Ashwarya got dropped off. And we don't have the next presenter. Is we so? look for it. Uh, yeah, we sent out messages also, but we have not got any response. Yes. Three, paper ID 384. Yeah, last paper. Yeah, supposed to be the last one. Ashwarya, you, you're back? Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, my internet wasn't good. Ma'am, uh, I can't. No uh, I'm, not, I'm not able to find paper ID three eight four. I had even uh, texted in the chat and uh, WhatsApp group as well. No problem. So we will skip for paper ID. Yes, ma'am. So ma'am, we are done with it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Then uh, we are uh, uh, completing this uh, track. Yeah. Thank. You. Thank you. Thanks for the work. Uh, thank much, thank you all the uh, student volunteers, Aishwarya as well as Neha. And also I thank Sadhana uh -huh. Madam for the opening remarks. And also I thank all the presenters uh, today. Thank you. Yeah, thank thank you so much, ma'am. You can switch on your yeah. camera. Sure, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Even whoever is there in the panel, you can sit down. Students, uh, student volunteers. Yeah, they can also sit down. Mom, my uh, available bandwidth isn't good. Uh, so I'm good with audio now. Yeah, okay, okay. Then uh, on behalf of WSTC, BHTC, I thank Dr. Vijay Lakshmi. For, for conducting and I thank all the participants who have presented the paper and also I'd like to thank uh, our student volunteer initially Sri Raksha and then Aishwarya both of them did a good job and I would also like to thank Neha Kumari who has who, who had hosted this event so thank you one and all and all of you join us for the evening and uh, closing ceremony where the best paper award would be announced Thank you all. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Sadhana, madam. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.